Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending today's session, Making Changes in the COVID-19 Era. Today's session will run about 45 minutes with time at the end to answer questions. Please post any questions in the chat box. Any unanswered questions will be answered offline after today's session. We have received a tremendous response to this webinar and we are hosting a large audience. If you experience technical difficulties, we suggest you exit the meeting and re-enter it using the link provided in the email. Rest assured that LexisNexis will distribute a recording of today's session in a follow-up email. Now we will meet today's presenter. I am your moderator for today, Monica Sorensen. I am the print marketing manager here at LexisNexis Canada. Today, we are fortunate to team up with business coach and author, Gary Mitchell. Gary has been working with lawyers and law firms since 2005, helping them navigate the business of law, including everything from marketing and BD, HR to leadership and management. His third book, Growing a Law Practice During COVID-19, was recently published by LexisNexis and is available on our bookstore. Today, Gary is going to share some of his strategies for navigating change. You can find this content and more in his newest book. Without further ado, Gary Mitchell. Thank you, Monica. It's great to be here today or here with you virtually uh, across Canada. And as Monica alluded to, I am going to talk about change. And change is tough. Um, change in general, some tips in general, change uh, during COVID-19. And then I'm going to hit some specific scenarios that I've worked through with clients, changing practice areas, changing firms, or changing locations. Some of these changes are a result of COVID-19, and some are not. But it's 2021, it's September, the end of September, and we're still dealing with COVID-19. You know, on a personal note, I was, I was really rushing LexisNexis. We've got to get this book out. We've got to get this book out. COVID-19 won't be around forever. Well, unfortunately, I was wrong. It's still dragging on. And depending where you are in the country and in the world, it's either bad or worse. Now, some of the content I'm going to share with you today in this webinar is directly from the book. Right? And I'm not going to do any plugs. This isn't a sales pitch. This is actually strategies and approaches. I have worked with clients through across Canada, so they're proven. Now, I encourage you, as Monica said, I encourage you to write your questions into the chat box. And at the end, I will do my best to answer as many, if not all of them, uh, as possible. If we don't get to your questions, I believe there will be a follow-up email from LexisNexis, and I will have the opportunity to answer your questions at that time. I will also leave you with my contact information so you can reach out to me directly. Now, there's no accident why I chose this image um, to start off the webinar talking about change in general. For most of us, change represents upheaval, anxiety, and stress. Change in the best of times can be daunting, messy, and uncomfortable. But then you add all the complications of COVID-19 as it drags on and on. The rolling restrictions and setbacks and lockdowns and masks and no mask and back to wearing masks and it's stressful. But here's something I really, if you don't take anything else away from today's presentation, please take this away. This is not a time for you to sit on your hands and wait for your competitor to try something as you normally do as lawyers. I know this, I've been working with you for 16 years. I know your strengths, I know your challenges, I know your fears. This is a time to actually get out there and try things ahead of your competitors. The worst can, that can happen is it doesn't work. That's the worst. But the best thing that can happen is it does work and you get yourself so far ahead of your competition because they're buried, they've got their heads buried in the sand. And let me give an example. I spoke to a young associate ooh, probably about seven months ago, and we did a consultation. And he got back to me and he said, like, he's second year call. And he recognized the need. He wanted to grow his practice. And hence the name of the book, right? Growing a Practice During COVID-19. And he was in a good situation, good mentorship, good firm, good support. Uh, but he got back to me and he said, you know what? I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until we're through COVID. 
and thought to myself, oh, do you have some magic ball? Uh, the rest of us don't, where you can see when we're going to get through COVID. I mean, think about this for a minute. When this hit in March of 2020, did you think we would be together on a, on a webinar right now discussing still COVID-19 and the ramifications it has for your law practice? I certainly wouldn't have thought that by any means. Let me give you a few, few tips to get started with change in general. Start small. Don't look at the whole big picture of this massive endeavor. It's overwhelming. It's too much. Now, chapter 12 of the book is called In Their Own Words. And I asked several of my clients that I worked with last year, uh, leading up to when the, when the lockdown came and throughout the rest of the year, to write their stories. And one of the stories hits home this point. It's a managing partner of a boutique employment firm in Toronto. And he said in his story, he said, you know, the work we did with Gary leading up to COVID by tackling small incremental changes, one at a time, added up to big change and how we were really well positioned and prepared when COVID hit. So I, don't listen to me, listen to him. Don't take it all on at once. Choose bite-sized pieces, pieces and tick them off. Make a list, check them off as you accomplish them, and it shows you a sense of momentum. You can see your progress. Go with the flow. <laughs> now, that may sound a lot easier than it is, but my point is this. If you feel you're pushing a boulder up the hill, it's likely not the right change, or it's not the right time for change, or you're not ready for the change. It shouldn't be that tough. When you're in flow, all kinds of things happen. It's like serendipity. Some things come to play that you wouldn't have expected because you're doing the right thing at the right time. So if it's that painful, if it's that hard, take a deep breath, stop and reevaluate. Maybe it's not the right time. Maybe it's not the right change. Shouldn't be that hard. When you're feeling stressed about change, focus on what it could mean. Your end game, the big picture. I always look, encourage my clients to look forward. What is the big picture after? This will help you get through the moments of stress. And these moments are temporary, by the way. You'll get through them. Change brings about renewal. It brings about the opportunity to learn and grow. And I know, as lawyers, you love to learn and grow. So embrace it. Change can often cause turmoil and confusion. We can't possibly know all the side steps and where things are going to go once we in, embark on change. <laughs> and if COVID-19 has not taught us anything else, it's we don't know what's around the corner all the time. So don't feel you have to have all the answers to get started. I've had several clients who are like, no, wait a minute, I got to figure this out. I got to figure that out. No, no, no. Start the change and trust the fact that at some point you will either learn what you need to uh, to deal with the new circumstances or you're going to find the people to help you with those new circumstances. Don't talk yourself out of it before you even get started. Don't feel you have to go through this change alone. If you have a mentor, if you're at a firm, talk to them. Or if you have a mentor outside of your firm, you're independent, talk to them. Talk to your spouse. If you have any other colleagues you can talk to, talk to a, co a coach. Nobody does everything on their own. Nobody. Change takes time. You have to be patient with yourself. I know, not one of your strongest uh, qualities. Um, you tend to want things uh, quickly. I know, I have the same personality trait. I want things to happen uh, quicker than they often do. But you need time to adjust to new circumstances. Again, being in the flow. Just, you'll know it when you're in there because you're not going to be stressed. Things are going to happen. It's going to just come seamlessly. As you're going through this change, keep your eye on the ball. Remember what you're doing this for, where you're headed. This will help you to adapt to new circumstances and roll with the punches. Perhaps most importantly, change will always require changing habits, breaking down old habits and creating new habits. 
this takes time. You know, when I'm working with my clients, I'm always saying, okay, this is a new habit I want you to start practicing. Don't beat yourself up because you're not going to master it between now and our next call. This is going to take some time. Be patient and understand what this is about. Change takes time. Okay, I'd like to know, uh, I mean, maybe it's obvious because you're on this webinar today, um, but in the, um, in the chat area, I'd like you to uh, answer this question. Has your practice been negatively affected by COVID-19? It's a single choice, yes or no. Uh, it could be any way, in any way negatively impacted. Revenue, hiring, location, clients. And Monica will tally that up. Uh, we should actually see the results on the screen. Oh, okay. There you go. 67% said yes, okay. and 33% have said no. Okay. Well, um, I think you're in the right place then, because I'm going to be sharing with you a whole bunch of strategies that will not only um, help you with change, uh, but also, uh, especially this next section, having a plan to get through this. Okay. So we'll close that, Monica. Right. Okay. Yes, you should be able to click it off. Yep, there we go. Okay. Um, if any of you have followed, you know, I've been writing for the Lawyers Weekly, now the Lawyers Daily since 2006. Um, if any of you have followed my writing, I've always advocated for having a plan, having a plan for everything, going to a networking function, which will come back again. I don't know when, I don't have that crystal ball, um, but having a plan for everything. I'm not a fan of just going off in all directions willy nilly. So why plan? Well, again, I've always been an advocate. Um, you know, I'm going to go through a business plan template that I've actually tweaked a little bit more about change, but I use this with all my clients. And it's about um, moving your practice forward. In this case, okay, changing. Um, I'm going to do that first, and then I'm going to dive into the various scenarios that I talked about at the beginning, the changing practice areas, changing firms, changing locations. Why plan? Well, your practice is a business and you need to start thinking of it as a business if you aren't already. Um, it makes no difference whether you're within a firm or on your own. You treat it like a business. If you're at a firm, I always say, treat your practice like a franchise, right? You can leverage the, the um, reputation, the marketing and everything else that comes with the firm, but treat your practice like a franchise. And obviously, if you're on your own, it's your own. But most successful business people start with a plan. Things can go awry. Things will change. Things will adopt. But if you have a starting point, you are far more likely to succeed. And in a shorter period of time, by going through the planning process. Now, I'm a fan of keeping things simple and practical. My, my clients actually really appreciate this. Because simple and practical, although not always easy, that approach works. So I'm going to show you the template that I use with my clients. It's in the book as well. Um, obviously, if you're out on your own, uh, you're, more, you're a little bit more entrepreneurial. You may be more prone to having a plan. But you partners at national firms, you know, if you just tweak the way you think about things and think of your practice as a franchise you're going to start to see a, di a little bit different um, approach in the, in the people around you and the management. So let me ask you this before we dive into it. Do you want to keep doing the same things you've done, expecting different or better results? Do you want to muddle through your career without focus, direction, and a clear path forward, leaving your success up to chance? Or would you rather have clarity, purpose, a definitive roadmap, and more control to successfully guide you through the rest of your career? It's your choice. It's that simple. I never tell my clients what they need to do. I, they, they know what they need to do. I help them get there faster. It's that simple. It's always your choice. Now, one thing I should mention, I've always advised my clients to stay nimble. <laughs> Uh, remain flexible. 
uh, roll with the punches, things you're not normally uh, used to, um, and adapt as the need arises. And if COVID-19 has taught us nothing else, it's this, we must, we never know, I said this at the beginning, we never know really what's around the corner. So we, we've always got to be flexible. But I'll tell you, when you have a plan to start with, if you get off the tracks, for whatever reason, the market, something like COVID comes along, you're much, you're much able or you're, you're able to get back on the tracks much faster when you have a plan. Now, before we get started, I have a warning for you. If you're like most lawyers I know, your mind is going to do two things. You're going to listen to me and you're going to look for what's wrong. It's your training. That's the practice of law. I'm talking about the business of law. So don't look for what's wrong in what I'm sharing with you. Look for what's right. As Monica mentioned at the beginning, we have a huge audience and it's extremely diverse. Uh, lawyers right out of law school, right up to senior partners at national firms and everything in between. So what I'm gonna share with you is broad based so that each of you can get a little something from this presentation. So don't look for what's wrong. It's your, it's your normal uh, habit. Look for what's right, take it and go forward with it. The other thing is don't race ahead to how. <laughs> this, this always happens with my clients. We're starting out in the planning stage, which is about the what, and they're always like, how am I gonna do that? How am I gonna do that? Don't worry about that yet. We're not at the how, we're at the what. We master the what first, it makes the how a lot easier. So what's in your plan? Um, this section's a little dry, it's boring, but it's necessary. Uh, it's been developed for, I guess, maybe my first year, second year in, so 14 years, I started using it and it tweaked it along the way. Um, take what you can, make it your own. Keep in mind, you should treat it as a living, breathing document and review it regularly. I recommend quarterly at a minimum. Things change, as you know. In normal times, things change. So you want to keep on track and keep abreast of those changes and how they affect your approaches. Now, especially in this time of COVID-19, you will need to stay flexible and adapt to changing circumstances. But again, I can't tell you the value of having a plan to start with. You get off the rails, you get back on faster. So, What's going to be in this plan that I'm going to share with you? First, fully understanding your target market. You may think to yourself, yeah, I know my target market. Do you? Um, I'm going to be asking some really specific questions going much deeper than most of you have gone before. Uh, how do I know that from working with my clients? They'll say, oh, I didn't think of that or, or I didn't uh, ask that question. That's what, this, that's what this exercise is for. Second part of the plan is evaluating your current state of your practice, where, you're, where you are now. Uh, that next, we'll look at defining your goals, where you wanna get to. And finally, we'll identify any learning uh, and developmental support that you need. Um, and that's basically the overview of the template. So let's dive in and let's talk first. Uh, and again, this will be more applicable if you're changing practice areas, uh, researching your target market. So we're gonna take a very close look at the target market or markets. Uh, if you're keen to see results from your efforts, I, su I suggest you follow this targeted approach. You will not only save time and money, and time is money, but this approach will spare you from all the frustration and stress of willy-nilly going off in all directions. The process of preparing for and implementing change takes time, as I mentioned at the beginning time that you don't have the luxury to waste. The more you understand about your markets and you, the, that you wish to serve or develop, the higher likelihood of your success. As you know, success is a great motivator. Once you've started down that path and you're starting to see some results, you're more motivated and inspired to do more. Know your market. Identify your ideal target markets. If there's more than one, list them all and rank them by priority. Being specific about which markets you want to target will help you to become more strategic in the way you approach them. 
it's virtually impossible to raise your profile in multiple uh, markets effectively. Describe any natural uh, business cycles that may exist within your target market. For example, is one time of uh, year busier than another? How do, you, how do economic cycles uh, affect your target market? Has COVID-19 changed or altered these business, business cycles? Has COVID-19 provided new opportunities? Look at plexiglass manufacturers, hand sanitizers, food delivery services, and Zoom. You get my point. Uh, changing cycles in the market are not just doom and gloom. They often provide new opportunities, new areas of, of law, new practice areas. Are these markets established or emerging? Does this affect your approach and how? What trends are you ob observing in your target market? This is really important to understand, to really fully understand your target market and anything and everything you can about them. Then let's take a look at your competitors or the people you may be looking to compete against if you're changing into a new area. Research and list the top firms or lawyers already in that target market. And if you don't know, and you have the ability to delegate it to someone else, uh, whoever that might be, delegate it. But here's the thing, it's really, really simple. For those of you who are not in the habit of being a Google addict, I am. If there's any question you need to have an answer to, Google. So let me give you an example, a very specific example. Say you're looking to go into construction law in Toronto. You simply Google construction lawyers Toronto. Magically, the list of construction lawyers will come up. And not only that, the lawyers that are doing the best at marketing themselves will come up at the top. So you can actually start with the top and move down and do your research into who they are, uh, how long they've been in the market, what their approach is, um, what they believe in, blah, 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 all of it right there. It's that simple. And, you know, maybe it's, a, it's an opportunity, depending on your time, how much time you have to do it yourself. Because um, it's a good exercise to really start getting in there and learning about the people who you're going to be competing against. Uh, from that search, you're going to get all the all the answers you need, right? It'll take you to their websites. That you'll look at their, their profile, their background. Uh, it'll give you an idea of what they're doing to market their practice. What does your competition have that you don't have? You know, if you're just starting out in that market, maybe your profile is low. Maybe their profile is higher. They've got experience. They've got years in the uh, uh, years in the target market. Look for what they're doing right and emulate it. But also look for what they're missing. If they're not as successful as you think they could be or as you think you can be, look for the holes. What are they missing? What are some opportunities that they are not taking advantage of to market their practice and themselves? So in that competitive intelligence, you're not only finding out who your new competitors are going to be, but you're finding out what they're doing right. And you're finding out what they're not doing right and where you could step in and fill that hole. Next, you want to look at your ideal client profile, right? Who do you wish to serve? Describe the size and type of file your ideal clients have. You can't be too specific. What does this entail? Are these complex files or matters? Um, make note of anything else about the type of work. Then look at the type of people. This will, you'll see later on when I go into the specific scenarios of changes, why this comes to play. Who is in a position to hire you? For B2B, business to business, what are the titles of the people that will likely hire you or influence the hiring uh, of you? For B2C, business to consumer, what are some of the personality traits of the people um, that are going to need your help? And what are they going to need? And okay. there's probably some um, common denominators here. And when you look at, again, you're still looking at your ideal client profile uh, to be as specific as you can about them. What values do they share with you? What values do their companies share with you? Make note of anything else you can find out about the type of people. And everything in context, who do you qualify 
uh, which clients you want to reach first, second, third. You know, over the years, and anybody in service knows this to be true, uh, we all have our A clients, B clients, and C clients. But if you're starting over, if you're making a change, and I, you will hear this again later on, you have an opportunity to recreate yourself. Press the restart button. Start from scratch. You might as well get crystal clear on the A clients that you want to attract. So you're no longer attracting B and C clients. And we don't have to go into the discussion of what B and C clients are like. We all know, right? You know. So what does the buyer in the buying process look like? Buyers of legal services wear a specific hat when evaluating suppliers. Sometimes the buyer isn't even the person who's going to be working, you're going to be working with. It's important to understand who's doing the buying, who's doing the influencing to affect your approach on how to build those relationships. What do you know about the buying cycle or process? So that's the time between the first time you meet with them and the time they make a decision to hire you. What goes on during that period of time? Typically, are they currently working with another lawyer or law firm? If so, how much do you know about them? Are they listed in your competitive intelligence? If they're not, they should be. How much do you know about your buyer's challenges? And you can never know too much. And by the way, this is really good information for your current clients too. If you think you could probably go deeper and learn more about who you're currently serving, these are all approaches and questions that could be very viable in helping you to maybe find out more opportunities with current clients. And uh, answering these questions may be tough. I, I know I've had I've had clients go, "Wow, I never thought of that," or "I've never uh, asked that question," or "I didn't take that approach." Um, I always say 80-20, 80%, 20, 80 uh, listening and asking questions, 20% talking. That's not, an all, not only an approach in new prospects and potential clients, it's also a very viable uh, approach for current clients. Let's take a look at your current practice. Uh, one of the first tasks I give a client in my coaching program is uh, to get them to do a marketing audit, okay? So this is to clarify uh, what they've done in the past, what worked well, what didn't work, and what they like the most, what they like to do the most. So I, I suggest you look at how and what you're spending on marketing. So that includes anything related to lead generation, uh, advertising, sponsorships, uh, events, SEO campaigns, digital marketing, the whole gamut. Here's some questions you can ask yourself directly from my marketing audit worksheet. What are you getting for your investment? What actions are working best? What things are not working or performing poorly? You really should know if what you're doing is working. If the money and time you're spending and investing in bringing in more clients is paying off. Make a list of everything you are currently doing to raise your profile and get in front of your target market and attract more clients. What professional networks affiliations and associations do you currently belong to? I know with COVID uh, right now, there's no in-person events, but that will come back. And there has been a lot of virtual uh, events still. Um, which trade journals, publications do you currently contribute to and why? What other actions are you taking to raise your profile? Examples can include internal bulletins, newsletters, blog, delivering workshops or webinars just like this. Which professional associations target your market or markets? Which professional publications target and serve your target markets? If you don't know the answers to these questions, it's time you find out. The easiest and fastest way to gather this information is to either ask your current best clients or your colleagues at your firm, if you're at a firm, or your colleagues, if you're out on your own, and people as you meet them, either on social media or at events when they start opening up. All you have to do is ask, what are they attending? What are they reading? Where do they hang out? Where are they getting further education, right? All you have to do is ask, and they will give you the answers to all those questions. 
Now your SWOT analysis, okay? The SWOT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It's especially to understand what point you're starting from, right? What are the strengths you already possess and what are some of the opportunities out there to leverage? So starting with your strengths, make a note of the things that people have told you over the years. Um, you've been known for. Yeah, either clients have complimented you for something or your colleagues have. Um, generally speaking, it's from feedback. What are you known for? What are the strengths that you're actually known for? Uh, weaknesses. List the things that you recognize are not your best skills. Now, an interesting point about weaknesses. The old school of thought, which I must confess, uh, years ago in my first business, in my 20s, I uh, followed. I followed the old school because there wasn't a new school yet. I'll get to that. <laughs> um, the old school of thought was you look at your weaknesses and then you do your best to improve on those skills or abilities to bring them up. The new school of thought, or as I like to call it, the Steve Jobs school of thought, is to focus all of your time, energy, money, investment on mastering your strengths, becoming a master. And then you build a team around you. You build a team of people that have the skills that not only take care of your weaknesses, go above and beyond. Because in most cases, the people that actually are good at those things that are your weaknesses actually enjoy it. We're all different. We have different skills. We have different likes. So I am firmly in the Steve Jobs camp as and why this exercise is so important. Because as you grow, this will also tell you the kinds of skills and people you need to bring on and you're, when you're hiring. It won't be like, oh, I just need a paralegal or I need an assistant. No, I need an assistant with these skills. You'll be, it'll be pinpoint accuracy for your HR and hiring. Opportunities. You know, I brought it up uh, earlier with, uh, with COVID-19 and any downturn or any, you know, a few years ago was marijuana. When the government legalized marijuana, there's like marijuana law going up everywhere. Um, just huge opportunities uh, for new practice area. Um, what are the opportunities? Is there uh, the opportunities in the market because of COVID-19? Uh, the market, to, the opportunities within your firm? because of any change of direction or st strategy, um, the market, uh, the opportunities in your location, uh, list all the opportunities that you see in front of you. And finally, threats. Now, threats don't occur very often. They're pretty serious. Um, these are things that would actually prevent you from moving forward with change uh, and success. Um, I have it here because it's, it is part of the SWOT analysis, uh, but don't get too hung up on it because they're, they're pretty rare. They're pretty tough. Um, and that's why they're pretty rare. Um, okay. Evaluating your current, uh, clients. This is about taking a closer look at the clients you've already brought to your practice. How ideal are they? Remember we talked about that ideal client profile. How do your current clients measure up to that profile? If not, how far off are they? In a perfect world, would you keep them? This is where we now go into change. If you're changing practice areas, how many of them do you think you can still hold on to? This has happened. I've, I've seen uh, lawyers change practice areas, but kept they kept the clients in the previous practice area because of the relationship. So it's important to know uh, how many and how are you gonna hold on to them? If you're changing firms, how many of them do you think will follow you? Best guess, you know, you can't be 100% accurate all the time, but what's your best guess? How many of them do you want to bring with you? If you recall, I said the, the, uh, a little earlier, changing firms gives you the opportunity to clean house. Uh, working with many clients who saw this as an opportunity to get rid of the deadwood, was one of the first things they said was, okay, I'm going to target these clients because I want to real, I want to bring them to the new firm with me, but this is an opportunity to let the other clients go and press the restart button. So take full advantage of it. There's lots of positive things about making changes. This is one of them, cleaning your client list. 
Now, how many, uh, if you're changing firms, how many and which clients will benefit from your move? How many can you see a direct correlation why they should be coming with you because of your new firm? Then let's take a look at your goals. Uh, describe in as much detail as possible what you want your practice to look like. What is the big picture? Think big, bold, hold no limitations. There's no filters here, okay? Nobody's judging you. There's no tests. This is just about you and what you want to create. These notes should include measurable goals, like but not limited to, I'm just giving you some ideas, the size of your team, number of clients, gross revenues, your personal income, and anything else that is relevant and important to you. Set your goals for the following timelines, 10 years, five years, two years, one year, six months, one month, one week, today. The reason why I start with 10 years is to encourage you, my clients, to think broader, to think bigger, to think big picture. Because most of my clients, and probably you, haven't thought past the next year, haven't thought past making that um, your targets and fulfilling your uh, obligations to your firm if you're at a firm or uh, your goals uh, for your solo practice or small firm. I want you to start thinking bigger without restrictions, because the most successful people in business and in law think big. Then what you do is with that information, you reverse engineer your goals and timelines to establish key benchmarks along the way so that you can decide what you start doing today, right now, as soon as you get off this webinar, to put this into motion. What's the first thing you can do when you get off this webinar? That's the first action. So I say, look into the future and then back it up. Again, I've given you the benchmarks, 10, five, two, one year, six months, one month, one week, today. Then I think it's also important to look at what does success mean to you? Because this is all about motivating you and keeping you motivated through the change, through the transition. You set your goals. It's also important to establish and clarify what your definition of success is. What does it look like for you? Not anyone else, not the guy across the street, not your neighbor, not your relative, you. So as a guide, and again, it's just a guide, uh, establish your success metrics under the following headings. Financial, whatever that means to you. Personal, that could mean more family time more work-life balance, more travel, career, uh, recognition, promotion, um, attention, awards, anything else. Anything else that you deem as a, a sign of success. Make a note of it, be clear on it. Now it's time to look at developmental needs. And again, I'm, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, uh, it depends on where you are in your career. It depends on the change that you're gonna make. Clearly, if you're changing practice areas, there's going to be some developmental needs. Um, where you are in your career as far as, uh, you know, if you're second year call or your 20 year call, if you're 20 year call, but you're changing practice areas, you're probably gonna have to go back and take some CLEs. So it's really clear on, uh, it's, it's important to get really clear on where do you think you need to learn and grow. So list in priority the top three areas you wish to develop. List the types of training you want or need. And this could be anything. This can be time management, leadership, delegation management. Um, on the technical side, what CLE modules do you need to take? Um, and if there, you know, if there are some, you know, I'll say this again later on, but um, Sign up, get started, right? Um, so now you want to take a look at the support that you need. Um, who is going to be there to support you? Uh, who will you be accountable to? Uh, could be a senior partner, mentor, if you're at a firm. Um, could be the marketing person, practice group leader, managing partner. Uh, if you're out on your own, could be spouse, colleague, uh, what have you. Could be coach. Um, who is going to help you stay accountable to the process? 
That's key. And then, of course, you want to get into action. And you've already spent the time um, in the planning process on uh, getting all the ducks in order, right? So then the most important part of a plan is actually implementing it. How many times have I heard all the planning that goes into something and then at the end of the day, the plan sits in a desk? And that's unfortunate. Okay, so uh, now we will go to that uh, polling question. Um, do you see the need to change practice areas as a result of COVID-19? Yes or no? Because that's the next section. I'm going to go specifically into changing practice areas. The results should come up in just a minute and everyone should be able to see the options. Okay, so maybe we've got some people that are looking at different changes. <laughs> um, okay, well, I think there's some value in uh, this next section. So I'm going to go right into it, Monica, if you want to take down that um, uh, poll thing. And let's see if this will click through to the next one. Yeah, um, changing practice areas. Okay, well, with COVID-19 having so much influence over changes in the legal industry, uh, there's no surprise there are a growing number of associates and partners considering changes. Um, I have done a lot of work in this area over the years, and including last year. Um, and I'm going to buzz through because I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. So I'm going to skip ahead to uh, basically the laundry list. Once you've made a uh, decision or you've been forced to uh, change practice areas, here are here is the order in which I advise you to uh, move forward. First, and perhaps the most important thing is to identify what makes you tick, okay? Um, if you're going to change practice areas, you might as well be going into an area that you know you're gonna thoroughly enjoy, um, probably be good at. In the planning stage, you've answered these questions, right? Who do you wish to serve? What are the types of people? Um, all of that has been done in the planning stage if you followed my advice so far. Then you wanna identify transferable skills, right? So now you know what you want to do, what you like, what you're good at, what are, what are the skills you can bring with you? You're not starting over, right? You've been practicing law for some time. You have the experience, you have skills, and you have relationships. So ask yourself the following. What are some of the transferable skills you could leverage in a new practice area? What has your experience taught you? Is there a way to leverage your current profile in a new practice area? What about your external contacts and relationships? Is there a way to leverage them for introductions? If you're at a firm, the same goes for internal relationships. Who do you know at your firm who could help you? Which lawyers at your firm could make introductions for you in new target markets? Changing direction does not mean starting from scratch. The key here is to look for ways to leverage your relationships and align those with current and merging opportunities. This is the most important part of changing law firms or changing practice areas. Leverage your relationships and align those with current and emerging opportunities. Identify those opportunities, and you've done that from your planning, the planning stage. Uh, your plan for action, into action, all of that comes from that planning stage. These are just more specific specifics to the changing of practice areas. Now, here's a real life example um, of changing practice, very successfully changing practice areas. Five year call litigator working at a firm he really enjoys working at with people he really enjoys working at and absolutely hates his job. He hates being a litigator. Um, thankfully for the firm and himself, he actually went to management before just leaving, leaving the firm and leaving the industry altogether, as so many associates do at four or five year call. It's unfortunate. Within six months of working together, we had him uh, shift over to an IP practice uh, focused on green energy. That was a value that was important to him. As you might imagine in Vancouver, 
that was not a tough uh, call, green energy companies and that mindset. So we going back to that first uh, point about changing practice areas, what makes you tick? That's what we examine. What is going to make him happy? What does he care about? Right? He took off. Literally within six months, he was basically back on the same partner track at a five-year call that he was before. But now he's happy. He's enjoying his work. And guess what? He's good at it. And he's going out and getting more clients. Let's talk about changing firms. Now, if there was a, a visual that had win, 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 I would have used it. Win for you, win for the firm, and win for the clients. Like any change, uh, moving to a new firm can be daunting and, uh, and overwhelming. And even in the best of times, in normal times, let alone uh, COVID-19, um, you've got new everything, new people, new culture, new management, uh, new systems, um, everything new. And you don't know what you're going into, right? You know where you are now, but you don't really know what you're going into. So once you've made the decision and the deal is done, signed on the bottom line, here's a laundry list. Pre-move, compile your contact list. This is most important. And this will include all of your professional contacts. You should include current clients, past clients, top prospects, and top professional colleagues or referral sources. And yes, friends and family. Prioritize your list for each category. And you do this based on the relationship you have with each person. Uh, the closer the relationship, uh, the higher up they are on the list. And those are going to be the first people that you approach. Now, at this point, you're not allowed to tell your current clients um, that you're moving because of law, school, uh, law of society rules. Uh, but you can reach out to your professional contacts, your friends and family. So take advantage of this time to do that now at that point. Then, once the formal announcement is sent out from your firm, reach out to your top clients, the ones you want to take with you the most. Take them out for lunch. Uh, pretty much across Canada now, it's indoor and outdoor dining. I don't know how much outdoor for Eastern Canada you have left. Um, but the opportunity is there to take your clients, your best clients, the ones you want to bring with you out for lunch. Then send out an announcement to all your other best contacts that you didn't get a chance uh, to reach out to in person at this point. So that's pre-move. Now you've made the move. Once you get in there, first step, sit down with the your new managing partner and identify the new partners and associates that you need to reach out to, who are like-minded, who will be most ad adaptable to introducing you to their clients. Uh, get to know your support staff. Uh, build relationships with them. Learn your new culture. Be a sponge. Continue to build internal relationships with the lawyers and staff. Very quickly, probably the most outstanding client I've ever had in 16 years of working with lawyers happened last year. It was March 9th, the week of March 9th, uh, 2020. I was in Mexico. I got an email request for consultation from a partner of a firm I was already working with. She didn't really know I was working with the firm. We had the consultation on Tuesday, March 10th. I'm making a point of giving you the dates on purpose. You'll see in a minute. Uh, the consultation went extremely well. There was a definite fit and she was ready to go. So excited. Here's her situation. Just six weeks prior, she had made the move from a boutique uh, firm as a equity partner that didn't have to do any business development. The nature of the firm was the work just flowed to her. Okay. She made a move to a national firm in a non-equity partner role with the mandate of not only growing her practice, but growing the practice group. Never have, having to do business development. So she admitted on the call, she was scared because she'd never done it before. But she was also excited about the opportunity. Then all hell broke loose. A few days later, I'm flying home from Mexico because the federal government said all people abroad should get home while you still can. Boom, lockdown, offices closed. So here she is transitioning. And all those tips I shared with you about moving firms, right? Um, and building relationships and all that. She had to do all of that distancing, working from home, which she had never done before. Oh yeah, and she's a single mom with two young girls taking care of them as well unbelievable and she was just listed in a month ago 
uh, is one of the top 40 lawyers across Canada in her practice area. Unbelievable. If she can do that during COVID, then any one of you can make a change seamlessly and without stress. The last uh, point or that's change is changing locations. And, you know, most of it I've already covered in changing firms, but the most important thing I want to leave you here with uh, changing locations, if you're at a firm and you're looking at moving across the country, which I've helped uh, clients do, this is more about your family than anything else, right? Obviously you see an opportunity for your career, but what I'd say is take your partner or your spouse and go out to uh, this new location Take a look around the city, look at the neighborhoods. If you have children, um, look at the schools and really ensure that this is going to be a good move for your family as well as your career. Um, I'm looking at the time, so I'm going to buzz ahead. We have a um, uh, final co polling question. What would you say your biggest challenge is with maintaining law practice during COVID-19? Is it practice management and working from home, marketing and business development, or HR hiring and training? You should be able to see the answers in just a minute. Practice management and working from home. Hmm. Well, then you should get the book because there's a whole, whole chapter on practice management with tips on working from home. <laughs> um, marketing and business development, that is not surprising. Hiring and training. Okay, good. Well, that's because um, that's been a challenge for a lot of people. So uh, thank you for that. Okay, uh, Monica, I think you're going to speak a little bit about, oh, we're going to go to questions. That's right. Um, so we have some questions. Uh, Monica, do you want to? Sure, we name? actually had uh, quite a few pre-submitted questions when people okay. registered, so we will start with those ones. Okay. Uh, the first question is, please advise how to handle the clients who are not so computer literate and insist on personal meetings. Okay. Uh, uh, well, without knowing what your comfort level is as far as putting on a mask and going to see people in person, um, I don't know that. Uh, what I would suggest is accommodate your client. Um, go and see them. Uh, it's frankly more billable time for you. Um, I mean, it, it also depends on the, the quality of the client. If they're, if they're a high value client, then you want to do everything you can to, to serve them to the best of your ability. And if that doesn't satisfy you, I'm going to have my email at the end. You can give me more details and I can properly like fully answer that. Uh, next question. What is the risk in changing firms at this time during COVID? Uh, what is the risk? Um, well, you know what I think about risk? Um, you risk you taking a risk when you walk across the street. Um, you take a risk when you order something at a restaurant. You don't know if you're going to like it. If it's good, maybe the, the cook is off. Um, there's always risk. I think you actually have the more important question is, Ask yourself, are you happy? Is this where you want to be for the rest of your career? Does this give you the opportunities to grow in your career? I think that's the real question. There's always risk. Next question is, what are the practice areas that have been negatively affected by COVID and what practice areas have been positively affected by COVID? Okay, that's a good question because it really does. Remember, I talked about op or opportunities and market challenges and trends and all of that. It does change. Uh, let me start with what's up, uh, and it's probably no surprise. Um, with people staying at home, uh, family law is way up. Um, employment law is way up. Uh, residential real estate is way up. We've all seen the markets. First, it was urban, and then now it's rural because people can work from home, so they're they're moving out uh, farther out of the cities. Uh, so residential real estate is up. On the flip side, commercial real estate is down. M&A is down. Corporate transactional work is down. Um, yeah, so that gives you a, just, just a few um, to start out with. Okay, next question. 
How did you get started coaching lawyers? Huh. Um, well, uh, let's skip that one, Monica, because it, it's, a, it's a longer story and we're, I'm looking at the time. Let's go to something that's more relevant for the, uh, for the listeners. Okay. How do you know it's the right time and the right move when changing law firms? That's a very good question. And uh, part of it I already answered. It's, um, are you happy where you are? Do you see yourself finishing your career at that firm? Is there opportunity or is there better opportunity from what you understand at the new firm? Um, you can only know so much. So at the end of the day, you will have to rely somewhat on your gut to make that final decision. Um, you know, I haven't, I haven't experienced personally uh, working with a lawyer who made the wrong decision in changing firms. I've only been, I guess, um, fortunate enough to work with lawyers who, who landed very well by making the change. Okay, our last question. This one came in from the chat. Can you briefly speak about managing employee expectations during the change? Um, that's a very good question because one of the, uh, I've always maintained one of the biggest challenges of all is communication. Um, and, you know, leading, herding cats, so to speak. Um, the biggest thing that you can do is regular, honest, and frank communication about where you're going. Okay. Um, you're not always going to bring everyone with you. That's just a fact. And in some cases, it's not a bad thing. Um, but managing, uh, managing employee expectations, the best thing that you can do is regular, frank, honest communication, having open dialogue, having people uh, provide input, always listen. You don't always have to agree, but always listen. And the communication is key. It's key to everything, actually. I hope that um, settles that one. I think, Monica, you have a, a couple of things to speak about the book. Yes, uh, I just want to mention that the uh, recording will be sent out in a follow-up email after today's session in about a week and a half. We'll have the recording and the video available. I'd like to thank Gary for taking some time to speak to us today and everyone who attended today's session. For anyone interested in purchasing a copy of Gary's book, it's at lexisnexus.ca slash store. We're offering 20% off right now to attendees with the promo code GROW20. The eStore link and promo code will also be included in the thank you email. Gary, would you like to say any closing words? Yeah, I just want to end with, um, first of all, here's my contact information. If you want to follow up with more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, change takes time. Be patient. And above all, I know you're perfectionist, but perfectionism is paralyzing. Thank you. Have a great day, and I wish you all the success in the world.